Somebody sent me what is called the top ten things my mother taught me. Number one, my mother taught me to appreciate a job well done. She said, if you're going to hurt each other, do it outside. I just finished cleaning. <laughs> Two, my mother taught me religion. You better pray that'll come out of the carpet. Three, my mother taught me irony. Keep crying and I'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> Four, my mother taught me about the science of osmosis. Now shut your mouth and eat your supper. <laughs> Five, my mother taught me about contortionism. Would you look at that dirt on the back of your neck? <laughs> Six, my mother taught me about stamina. You'll sit there until that spinach is gone. <laughs> my mother taught me about weather. Your room looks as if a tornado went through it. You ever hear that? Eight, she taught me about hypocrisy. If I've told you once, I've told you a million times. Stop exaggerating. <laughs> she taught me about behavior modification. Stop acting like your father. And most important of all, my mother taught me about justice. Justice. One day you'll have kids, and they'll turn out just like you. <laughs> well, it's that last one, justice, that gets me to thinking. Because we all want justice. And yet the reality is, in a very unfortunate way, mothers often don't get justice. In fact, I read of a young man this past week, 15-year-old, got home from school, starving, hungry, immediately went in search of his mother. Mom, mom, no mom. Went through the garage, downstairs, no mom. Upstairs he went, found her in her bedroom, lying in her bed. She didn't look well. Mom, he said, suddenly shocked and worried. Are you sick? She said, well, I'm not feeling too well. I'm kind of weak. He said, oh, no, mom, mom. He thought about it a minute, and then he said, well, Mom, don't worry. I'm 15. I can carry you down to the stove. <laughs> <laughs> I read that, and I thought, moms just don't get justice. <laughs> they give and give and give, and too seldom receive our gratitude. And we want justice. We want justice for mom. We want justice for us all. Sometimes we want justice fair and square and now. Such was the case when the mother heard her seven-year-old son screaming, screaming and crying. She rushed into the bedroom. There was his two-year-old sister, her fingers intertwined into his hair, pulling for all she was worth and laughing while he screamed. The mother immediately assessed the situation, bent down, and, and slowly, carefully unfurled the little girl's fingers from his hair. There, there, there. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. She, she doesn't understand. She doesn't know that that hurts. Please, she wouldn't hurt you on purpose, kissing away his tears. He was drying his tears, and she decided all was well. She was telling him she just doesn't know. She got up, walked out of the room about two steps down the hallway. Suddenly, her two-year-old was screaming, screaming, crying, rushed back into the room. What happened? The little boy said, she knows now. <laughs> Isn't that the way it is? We want justice, fair and square and now. And if we have to be involved in it, we'll be involved but we want justice. Then enter Noah. Enter Jonah, forgive me. <laughs> We're going too far back. Enter Jonah. And Jonah is not getting the justice. He not only wants, but he almost demands. Jonah's not getting it. Truth is, I think I owe an apology to Jonah. As I began to study Jonah some months ago and have spent more time in Jonah's story than I ever have in my life, I've come to the conclusion that I need to apologize to Jonah. I'll tell you, in the beginning, I had envisioned him simply as a petulant prophet. He didn't get what he wanted. Things didn't go his way. He didn't even like these people. Why was God being nice to them? And to top it all off, he had uttered a prophecy that wasn't going to come true. Would he now be known as the one whose word did not get fulfilled? I viewed him as superficial and pouting. And then I began to study in depth his story. And I think I owe Jonah an apology. 
I need to say to Jonah, I'm sorry. Because as I consider your story, I am far more like you than I had ever realized before. Understand that Jonah wanted justice. He wanted the world to work according to justice. He wanted a God of justice. And when he looked at the people, the ancient Ninevites, he saw their cruelty, their viciousness, the scourge of the ancient world, and he knew intuitively these people don't deserve God's mercy. They deserve God's justice. He just wanted justice. Don't we all? We don't just want justice for mom. We want justice for us all. And that's what Jonah desired. And that's precisely what had not happened. Now next week, in our last in this series, we will consider what Jesus has to say in the New Testament about Jonah. But for today, we go to the last chapter of his book in the Old Testament, the book bearing his name, the book of Jonah, page 1383 in your pew Bible, or Jonah chapter 4. This chapter that we study, the last chapter, I would suggest to you, unfolds in three movements. Three movements that I've entitled fuming, that's number one, waiting, that's number two, and learning with a question mark, that's number three. Now, we're going to begin reading, actually, in the last part of chapter three, the last verse of chapter three. The reason is simple. From what we know of the early manuscripts of the Bible, there were n they had none of what we have today. The paragraphs and the verses and the chapters and the chapter headings and the indentations and all the things that make it so much easier to read the Bible. No, those manuscripts ran straight together, all together. Sometimes it must have been very hard to sort out where one reality ended and another began. But there was one advantage to that. The advantage was it was harder to miss the connections that are in the text. For us, when we finish reading a chapter, we are prone to stopping, maybe picking up from there tomorrow or next week. And then we miss what is sometimes the tight tie between two chapters. Well, such is the case here. So we're going to begin reading that first movement of the last chapter called fuming. Fuming. We're going to begin reading that with the 10th verse of chapter 3. Here's what it says. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? He saw what God did. When the people turned, God turned. And the threatened destruction did not materialize. And then it says in verse 1, To Jonah this seemed very wrong, and he was angry. As I read the different commentaries, it was interesting how the different scholars rendered this. One said, best way to render it is to say, But to Jonah this was evil, a great evil. Another said, no, the better way to translate it is, To Jonah this was a calamity, a great calamity. So he became angry, and the word there is of a burning, seething, storming anger inside of him. He saw what had happened, and he grew very angry. It's about right there that we tend to stand in judgment of Jonah. We tend to point our fingers at him and say, Jonah, quit the pouting. Just because God is being good to someone else, you're going to pout? Let it go. But it's right about there that I need to apologize to Jonah. Because as we have already seen, the people against whom he preached were the scourge of the ancient world. We would probably say they were the terrorists of the ancient world if we were using terminology that we often use today. So for Jonah, it was clear. You do those kinds of things. You perpetrate those kinds of acts on innocent people, on women, on children. And then what you need is justice, judgment. 
And instead, mercy? Are you serious, God? You're going to give them mercy? I apologize to Jonah for thinking it was superficial. Jonah just wants justice. And with justice, he says, I don't want them treated so mercifully. Do you understand that? August 2007, right here in this sanctuary, we were visited by a movie producer named Martin Doblemeyer. Many of you will remember the visits of Martin Doblemeyer. On that occasion, he was here to screen a movie he had recently made entitled The Power of Forgiveness. In the movie, The Power of Forgiveness, it, is, it features seven different stories of people who were wrestling with whether or not they ought to forgive. Some were able to make that step and offer forgiveness. Others were not able to do so. And the movie detailed the realities of what happened, the consequences, the sometimes unexpected, unanticipated consequences of either forgiving or not forgiving. One of the people interviewed in the movie was Ellie Wiesel. You remember the name Ellie Wiesel? Concentration camp survivor. Family members lost to the Nazi war machine, extermination machine. Friends, people of his race, lost by the hundreds, by the thousands, by the millions. Ellie Wiesel was interviewed in Doblemeyer's film. While concentration camp footage runs, the narrator speaks about Wiesel. Here's what the narrator says. Ellie Wiesel was one of the few who lived to walk out of the camps. His father died only weeks before the end of the war. For the next 10 years, he was virtually silent about the experience. But for the last half century, his gift for putting words to the nightmare that was the Holocaust has helped generations never to forget. Then the footage shifts and shows Wiesel speaking in the remains of a concentration camp. And he is saying, so look and listen. Close your eyes and listen. But open your hearts and listen. Listen to the question that we asked ourselves then. What happened here? And then the scene shifts again. And an elderly Wiesel grapples with the powerful emotions that are going on in his heart and his life and have for almost all of his life. He's trying to make sense of the Holocaust later in life, and he says, I composed a prayer. Literally, I composed a prayer saying, God of mercy, have no mercy on these souls, on these murderers of children. God of compassion, have no compassion on those who kill these children. As he speaks, the scene shifts to show young Jewish children rolling up their sleeves, showing the tattoos of their numbers that would replace their names. Wiesel continues, I was criticized all over the world because it was published all over the world, but I felt it. I felt it, and I still feel it. Some persons do not, he says, do not deserve forgiveness. And these are the persons, really, who went beyond the human capacity for evil. They went beyond it. As you think of those images you have seen, those piles of Jewish corpses littering the concentration camp crematoria, you can understand Wiesel, can't you? Understand why he might come to the place where he said, Oh, God of compassion, do not have compassion on them. Well, if you can understand Wiesel, then you can understand Jonah. God, he says, I told you this was what would happen. I told you before I ever left home. I told you this would happen. Why did you bring me out here to do this? I want justice, not mercy. But then as Jonah talks to God, he sorts out exactly, exactly why he knew this would happen. 
He says, I knew this would happen. Why? Because you are a God full of grace and compassion, slow to anger, and abounding in love. Grace, compassion, slow to anger, abounding in love. Do you realize that that statement is something of a creed that describes the character of God in the Old Testament scriptures? It, it appears seven different times, almost word for word, sometimes at key moments in Israel's history. Sometimes spoken by God, sometimes spoken by the prophet, it appears to describe the character of God. Moses was there when God spoke the words. David speaks the words. Joel, Ezra, and here Jonah speaks the word. This God is what you are like. And because you are like that, we're not going to get justice. And he fumes with anger. When was the last time you were angry at the grace of God? Did you stand to sing in church and out of the corner of your eye see him over there? He was your partner in business, but due to his shady dealing, you no longer have that business. He basically built you out of it. And here he dares to stand and sing. And as you look at him, you can see a tear running down what you would say is his hypocritical cheek. And you say in your heart to God, don't have mercy on him. He knew exactly what he was doing. When was the last time you were angry at the grace of God? When you saw him walking with that woman who was your dearly loved wife and they were headed to church. When was the last time you felt anger at the grace, the compassion, the mercy of God? At that moment you felt that. You can nestle in beside Jonah and fume right with him. God, I want justice, not mercy. That's the first movement, fuming. Second movement, we go back to Jonah, the fourth chapter. Second movement, movement I've chosen to entitle, waiting. Waiting. Back to Jonah 4, we go back and read beginning with verse 5. It says, Jonah went out and sat at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, set in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a gourd and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the gourd. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the gourd so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the gourd? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. <laughs> Waiting. What's he waiting for? He's gone out east of the city and sat down to wait. Is he waiting, hoping that maybe God will change his mind? Is he waiting for the 40 days to play themselves out, hoping that maybe at the end of the 40 days, maybe then judgment will fall? Is he waiting, thinking, surely if I wait here long enough, the Ninevite repentance will prove to be bogus? Or is he waiting? Because he doesn't know what else to do. What else do you do when you see a very clear wrong in the world and you want justice and instead of justice, you get mercy? What else do you do? So he waits. But thankfully, he doesn't wait just in the sun. He builds himself a shelter which must have been reminiscent to the original hearers of the story, must have been reminiscent of those shelters built by the Israelites to celebrate their pilgrimage in the wilderness. They celebrated it once a year, the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths, it was called. 
Or maybe some would even have some echoes of Zechariah who described those shelters, those booths, and said that they would sit in those booths and they would watch all the nations around them, the nations who had been their enemies, coming to receive the true God. Well, Jonah is not sitting there waiting for them to receive the true God. He's sitting there waiting for God to bring about justice. And it's a bad scene because it is hot and the sun beats down. So even though he has a shelter, he is so thankful when that gourd grows up over his head and covers him. In fact, the text, the precise words of the TNIV are that Jonah was very happy. You ever been out in the desert sun and then found a shade? You can understand why he's very happy. It provided some ease, some comfort. Now I will have some comfort as I wait to see whether or not judgment falls. Interesting, is it not? One almost wonders if there isn't an allusion here to Jonah retreating to some categories that he has about God and life and the world and feeling some comfort in those while the real and the true God is acting outside of the boundaries of Jonah's degree of comfort. But the comfort doesn't last because as God is wont to do in this book, he provides two more forces of nature. He provides a worm, kills the plant, and he provides a scorching east wind. Now, I want to get you into the mood, into the mindset of why Jonah says, I wish I were dead. I want you to listen to one Bible commentary as it describes the realities of what Jonah was facing. A scorching east wind, says the commentary, is normally called a Sirocco. Dennis Bailey in the geography of the, of the Bible describes it thus. During the period of a Sirocco, the temperature rises steeply, sometimes even climbing during the night, and it remains high, maybe 16 to 22 degrees Fahrenheit above the average. At times, every scrap of moisture seems to have been extracted from the air so that one has the curious feeling that one's skin has been drawn around one more tightly than usual. Sirocco days are peculiarly trying to the temper and tend to make even the mildest people irritable and fretful and to snap at one another for no apparent reason at all. Obviously, such a wind desiccates and withers all green growth. When a Sirocco comes, all who can hasten to find shelter. But for Jonah, there was no shelter unless he was willing to re-enter Nineveh. The booth he had made for himself would not exclude the wind, exclude the wind, and only partially broke the sun's rays. Completely dispirited, he said, I would be better off dead than alive. Things are miserable for Jonah. Where is justice? Now where is protection? Where is God? And yet Jonah feels he is right. So he's at a very dangerous place. It's a dangerous place to be when you sit waiting, knowing that you are right, and yet right is not happening in the world. In fact, Clarence Schilt, formerly pastor here at the university church on the pastoral staff, said it well one day. He wasn't referring to Jonah, but he said it well one day when he said it this way. We do most of our sinning when we're right and when right isn't happening. We do most of our sinning when we're right, and right isn't happening. Because it is at those moments in times that we want to take things into our own hands and do whatever it is that we need to do to bring around the right result. So Jonah's at a dangerous place. Have you been at that place? That place when you look and you say, God, justice needs to fall. I'm right. And Jonah waits. Waits. The third movement of the chapter. First, fuming. Second, waiting. Third, learning. A 
a question mark. Because God is indeed trying to teach. But whether or not Jonah is actually learning, well, that's up to question. Back to Jonah chapter 4, the last two verses, starting with verse 10. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this gourd, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? The piercing, probing, penetrating question. The most important question in the book is God's final question. Jonah, should I not have concern for Nineveh? I read Hebrew scholars who say that that word concern has a central meaning to have tears in one's eyes. And so God says, Jonah, should I not have tears in my eyes over Nineveh? Over all the people, yes, responsible, but caught in a culture of violence? Should I not have concern even for the animals caught in the reality of that kind of a culture? Will you disallow me having tears in my eyes over this great city? Jonah, it's a probing question. And it's a most interesting question to ask of Jonah in the world in which he lived. Because in the world of Jonah, in this post-exilic Israel, there was a call, a focus on faithfulness to God. There was a call that said, we are the ones who are left. We are God's remnant. We are his remnant people. So we need to pull in and focus on faithfulness and be very careful not to allow ourselves to intermingle in any way with the nations around us. That's what got us into trouble in the past. And so the focus in Israel was a narrowing focus on this remnant. And then God said, Jonah, should I not have tears in my eyes over them? He chooses what may have been the most egregious example of violence in the world of that time. Almost as if to say, I have concern for them. And so everybody that is less violent, less evil, obviously are the focus of my concern as well. I want you to listen to James Bruckner, Old Testament scholar who writes this, the book of Jonah forced Israel and Judah to consider that their deliverer and Lord was not theirs alone, but the creator of a wide creation that included other people. At a time, listen, at a time when other prophets preached about a faithful remnant in Judah, Jonah proclaimed a creator whose concern for his remnant people did not preclude his concern and action on behalf of other peoples. The inclusion of the book of Jonah in the Hebrew Bible was a brilliant faithfulness to the broad vision given to Abraham in Genesis 12, all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. The book's viewpoint pushed the chosen people range of vision extravagantly wider at a time when the national consciousness, both before and after the exile, threatened to grow more narrow. Do you understand what Bruckner said? He said, because of the problems that had been experienced with the nations around them, the vision had grown increasingly narrow. And then suddenly Jonah bursts on the scene and unwillingly delivers a message about God. And it's a message that says God's playground is the world. God's people are found in every place, even in the most violent. God's concern is with compassion and mercy. God's desire is that his people reach out beyond the boundaries with which they are comfortable. And so ultimately, the book of Jonah is about God. 
the kind of God we serve. Read the book and you'll discover there is no call to action. It doesn't here say, love others as you love yourself. It doesn't here say, treat others as you would have them treat you. It doesn't here say, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It doesn't say that. What it does say is that it gives us a vision of God. God whose mercy exceeds our comfort. God who is willing to reach beyond our boundaries. In fact, I think, I think, if you want a sentence that will summarize the book of Jonah, this one just might do it. God will ultimately bring justice. But on the way to that, He thrives on showing mercy. God will ultimately bring justice. But on the way to that, he thrives, thrives on showing mercy. And because of that, he breaks apart our categories, our boundaries, the ways that we believe that he should conduct himself. Can you imagine in the book of Jonah, God risks, he risks being told you have no interest in justice. He risks that just in order to show mercy. And he shows it not only on a people who were violent, but he shows it on a people whose repentance did not last. A people whose repentance was apparently fleeting and justice ultimately came. It breaks apart the categories, the boxes in which we sometimes try to encase God. I like what Fred Craddock New Testament scholar, homiletician extraordinaire. I like what Fred Craddock says along these lines. He didn't say it about Jonah, but he might as well have. He said this, I reject any notion, I reject any notion that makes God less of a Christian than I am. I reject any notion that makes God less of a Christian than I am. And God does that to Jonah, breaks open the categories and says, I'm willing to risk justice for a while to show mercy in ample supply. Three movements in the fourth chapter, fuming, waiting, learning, question mark. Why is there a question mark? Well, there's a question mark because the book ends with a question mark. It ends with a question. In other words, Jonah never in the book answers the question. We may wonder why. But maybe that is actually very purposeful. Maybe the book ends with no answer to the question because the question will need to be answered time and time and time again by people like you and me. And so God asks that question of Jonah. God asks that question of us. Shall I not have tears in my eyes over the desperately lost?